Hello, welcome to my live stream. Um, let me know if uh, you can hear me all right, if there are any issues. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to do something a bit different than the usual. Uh, today we're going to talk a bit about ChatGPT. And I think this is an awesome tool that uh, I've played with it a bit. And personally, I think it is great. It is something that, yeah, it might actually revolutionize how software development works and today the purpose of this live stream is to basically demonstrate that demonstrate how that works um so i have taken upon myself a little challenge which is to design a little programming language which can be used for designing circuits now if you're not familiar with how logical circuits work I strongly recommend uh, this video series from Sebastian Lake. Um, I think he does a great job explaining how logical circuits work. And um, yeah, go go and watch them if you don't know what I'm talking going to talk about. Yeah. Now the whole idea here is that let's just look at the logical circuit. Okay, so let's say that we have this little logical circuit, right? So we have a bunch of inputs. Uh, this is a gate. I think this is um, not. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, let me just check because I don't want to be wrong about this. Okay, so that would be an AND gate. So you have a bunch of inputs and you have an output, and then you have a series of logical operations like and not and so on that uh, can basically uh, take these inputs and then apply these operations to them okay um, now this is kind of what uh, Sebastian has been doing in his visualization uh, he's been basically building something that looks kind of like this now in his example it doesn't actually look like this. It looks a bit um, more interesting, but yeah, it's fine. It's okay. Um, now, for me as a programmer, I think it makes a lot of sense that you can write basically some code that can generate these gates, this configuration here. Um, now, I'm aware of languages such as VHDL and Verilog, which this is what they're designed for. Um, but I thought about um, it would be fun to make it be, try to make my own, which is going to be a little bit simpler than those. Um, now, personally, I've wanted to use VHDL, but looking at how, I don't know, let's try to find uh, some code that... To me, the way VHDL looks is, uh, it kind of reminds me of COBOL for some reason. Um, it is very verbose, you have to type a lot to get something out of it. Um, Verilog is a bit nicer. But um, yeah, I just wanted to have uh, something to play with. So I think this is going to be great for that. Um, yes, uh, so somebody is has noticed that I am using Windows. Um, the little simulator that I'm going to try to build, I will try to build it in C Sharp. Uh, usually I would use C++ and other tools on Linux, but today I'm just feeling like changing things up a bit. All right, um, now related to ChatGPT, um, this is a uh, basically if you're not familiar with ChatGPT, it is basically an AI trained with a lot of uh, natural processing abilities. Um, and it can do things like uh, you can type in here a prompt and then it can uh, basically respond like a real human would be. I mean, seemingly like a real human. And... Um, now, I've been playing around with it a bit for writing code, and I think this is one of the parts that works best about it. Uh, one of the, its best part. Uh, yes, sometimes it's wrong, sometimes it generates bad code, sometimes 
it doesn't understand what I'm trying to say. But um, yeah, a lot of the times it does. And I've basically noticed a kind of like two um, main ways of using ChatGPT. Uh, the first one would be to try to get it to... Um, yeah, so basically these are the main use cases for where ChatGPT will work best. Um, the first one would be um, to try to g introduce, uh, to basically get an explanation for introductory topics. Like, okay, I don't know how to do this. So can you explain this to me? So let's see how it would respond to a prompt where I ask it, how can I make my own programming language? And from my research, um, from my playing around with it, I've noticed that it works pretty well for, uh, you know, giving us an introduction to a specific topic. Um, it's not always correct, but usually if... So, this is also... Uh, it also matters whether it's a uh, well-known topic or is just a very obscure uh, subject. If it's a very well-known topic and there are a lot of people know about it, then yeah, it uh, will generate something pretty correct. Okay, so here you can say it. You can see that it uh, generated. It told us to some basic steps on how you can design a language. Yeah, so choose a specific purpose or domain for your language, of course, um, then design the syntax. And we're going to do this in just a moment. Um, then implement the parser and then create a standard library of functions and modules that can be used with the language. I mean, these are very good steps. It, it's not wrong here. It's actually very correct. Um, oftentimes I'd wish it would go a bit into more detail and I found it difficult to get it to give me more detail. You just have to ask about very specific things. Um, for example, here I want to design the syntax. Okay, so let's say that I want to implement the parser. So I would ask it, how can I implement my own parser? And it will probably suggest using a tool like Yak or Bison. Yeah, the second use case where I found it works very well is when you ask it to write code, which is not super advanced. So it's not some super obscure thing. It's something that is pretty common. And it can also tie together uh, parts of uh, code, which is very nice. Uh, for example, I used it to create some automation scripts, which would uh, go to my email and they would... Um, uh, basically look for emails with a specific, uh, from a specific um, email address and then downloading all the, downloading all the attachments and unpacking the zip archives. Yes, for something like that it works pretty great. Uh, all of these things are kind of simple, uh, simple steps and all it has to do is just put them together into a sequence of steps and for that it works pretty well. Okay, so to implement a parser, you will need to use a parser generator tool or a library such as Antler, Bison, or Lemon. Yeah, that's pretty great. Okay, so let's think about um, how to how this language should be designed. Now, the way I thought about this uh, was to do something pretty simple. Um, so I was thinking about using a Python-like syntax because um, Python is a pretty well-known language and its syntax is uh, very simple, very clear, very easy to read. And um, to have it look kind of like this. So let's say that we want to implement a module which adds two numbers. I would say something like module and then the name. Uh, this is basically just like the def in Python. And let's give it a name, I don't know. Four, uh, adder four. 
So let's say that this is a 4-bit adder. And then here I define the parameters. And let's say that I want to add A plus B. And uh, we also want to have a carry in. And this would output um, the output of this uh, module would be basically the result, so R, and then the carry out. Now, to make it, to specify that this is a 4-bit, I, I think using like um, an array syntax would work pretty well. So A of 4, B of 4, and then the carry in is just a 1-bit, and then the result would be something like this. Okay, and now we specify how this works. Um, uh, yeah, something I was thinking of is because one of the most common things in when designing logical circuits is working with truth tables. Um, if you don't know what a truth table is, the basic idea is that you build a table like this. So A, B, and then carry, and then let's see what we want to get from that result and carry out. So when the inputs are 0, 0, 0, then the result should be 0, carry out should be 0. When the inputs are 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, plus, 0 plus 1 will give us the result 1, and the carry out would be 0, and so on. We will continue uh, doing this for the whole, for all the possible values of a, b, and c. Okay, uh, now in order to use this module, let's create a simple adder that just adds two bits together. And then we can link them together inside the adder for. Okay, so how would this work for a sum? Let's see. Uh, we can in fact just uh, ask it to generate a truth table. Um, I'm still thinking about the syntax while doing this. Um, okay, so let's just uh, say something like this. R and C out equal truth table. And I want to make this a keyword truth table. Uh, and then I also have to give it the inputs. So let's say that I give it these inputs. And then let's just use like a dictionary syntax to specify it kind of like this. So 0, 0, 0. And the outputs of that would be 0, 0. Um, now, hmm, I'm still thinking about how to do the syntax more cleanly. Okay, so the idea here is that um, we're going to look at A and B, and if it's an array, then this should be a 4-bit number, for example, here. But in this case, it's just 1-bit. Okay, so we, yeah, I think we don't need any separator. Let's just do this. So first is result, and then carry. One zero will be the result will be one and the carry will still be zero. Uh, one plus one equals one zero in um, in binary, so that means the result should be zero and the carry should be one, and so on. We can continue this for all the possible combinations. One 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 one, and then. Uh, 1 added to 0 plus 0 is 1, carry 0. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1. And finally, 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals uh, 1, 1 in binary, which means carry is 1 and the result is 1. So this is how I would make an adder 
I would just use a truth table. Okay, so that looks pretty simple. But um, okay, so how how can we tie all of these together? So here I since this has two values. In fact, okay, let's simplify this a bit. Let's not use the parentheses at all. Let's just have a comma like this. I think this should work fine. Um, should I drop the parentheses here as well? Uh, okay, I'm just, yeah, sure. Okay, I think it just is more clear with the parentheses, so I'm gonna leave it. All right. Okay, so how would we tie all of this together? So we would call adder of a of zero and b of zero and c in. So these would be the inputs. And I would put this into the result of zero. And uh, the carry, I would uh, create a temporary variable for the carry. So I don't know, let's just have var c. Um, I think we can make this four bit as well. Uh, so how would we design an adder, a four bit adder by using this? Uh, the basic idea would be to basically, the basically, uh, the idea would be to that okay uh, we're gonna have a carry from this sum here and we want to put that carry into the next calculation so for that i can just do c of zero equals adder and this is how i called uh, this adder and it will place the results into r of zero and c of zero and then r of one and c of 1 would be equal to the other with a of 1, b of 1, and c of 0. So we're using the carry from the previous calculation. And I just have to repeat this two more times. Okay, and then for R3, the third bit, and then we can just write this directly to the output. So I don't need uh, four, I can just use three here. Okay, something like this. Yeah, I think this work looks pretty well looks pretty good for a language what do you think does this uh, mini language look good to you looks pretty good to me um, and then okay let's have a simple example with a very simple I don't know like an and module that has a and b and it will output a single value r I'm thinking of removing these parentheses because it will make the parser a bit easier to write. So let me just do that. All right. And how would we implement an operation like end? Uh, the idea would be to just do R equals A and B. So we're going to use the normal uh, expression. Okay. So how can we make ChatGPT generate a language parser for us? Um, so it told us about a few libraries such as Antler, Bison, Lemon, and there are many others, Yak and Bison. Um, let's just use Antler. I think it's easy enough. So an Antler grammar. Yeah, so this is something that I also noticed um, is how you ask ChatGPT to do stuff for us. Um, if I kind of have to use this imperative tone, like I would give it a command, generate a grammar which does this, this, and this. If you ask it, uh, I don't know, 
could you write some code for me? It's just going to give you some nonsense about how it doesn't work or how it can't do that. Or So uh, knowing how to ask it kind of helps. OK, so let's generate an unclear grammar for a Python like language that supports that only supports um, bit operations and then uh, the other thing is we don't want classes we don't want any of that advanced stuff and writing and functions so let's see what it generates for us and then we can guide it towards closer towards what we want okay yeah it's generating it works um we can remove all of these because we're not going to use them Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to let it finish generating this. Okay, so let's just first remove the while and what else it generated. Oh, come on, network error. I've uh, encountered this before too many requests yeah some usually when that happens i just have to reset the thread it's annoying but yeah now we have to wait a bit more <laughs> till it generates it again yeah uh i really i really like uh using chat gpt i think it it works great with some uh, programming tasks for example this i've never looked at an antler grammar before i've never used antler before and now i'm just asking um okay now it generated something worse um i think it might be missing something okay yeah it, it didn't generate the while and the did it read my mind? Okay, so it basically generates a program which is made up of statements. And a statement can either be a function, definition, or a bit operation. Okay, but this bit operation is missing something. Um, what the hell is this? Yeah, sometimes it's wrong. Um, try again. Okay, here's a revised version that includes a few additional features. Yeah, this looks a bit more like what I would expect. But those bit operations are a bit strange to me. Ah, oh, network error again. Okay, let's uh, let's try to change a bit the query. Maybe we can get it to generate something better from the first try. So generate an antler grammar for a Python-like language that supports the following operations, defining and um, defining functions with arguments we do want to have arguments there um variables and what else um simple expressions that only contain uh, binary operations don't Okay, 
Uh, let's just try it like this and see if we get something better out of it. Yeah, now so we generally do something a bit different. Uh, so last time uh, the program could contain uh, functions or statements, so it could contain multiple things. But here, um, it only allows a program to contain functions, which is fine for me because I want it to um, just have modules at the top level. All right, and then it created this um, function definition, which is def and then um, an identifier and then the list of arguments, which is looks pretty good and then a list of statements. And a statement can either be an assignment or an expression. Yeah, okay, I'm pretty happy with this. Um, let's see if we can um, get it to do a bit more for us. Um, can you add support for specifying the return types? Ah, okay, so it's using um, a semicolon instead of, it's using colon instead of um, the arrow that I made, but other than that, it looks pretty fine. Okay, let's just uh, take this and um, have this as our starting point. I think this looks pretty good. Okay, uh, now I I was thinking about writing this in C-sharp, so let's just ask it, how can I uh, create a parser in C-sharp for this, for this grammar? Oh, come on. Uh, something's not right with ChatGPT today. It's not feeling that well. Oh no. Okay, so let's just take what it generated here. And I'm gonna copy it into a new file. And um, yeah, let's create a folder here. I'm gonna call it a very creative name, Circuit Lang. Um, I have no idea how to make this work, so let's just call this um, grammar.txt. Uh, we're gonna rename it to something else probably, but let's start with this. Can it work now? Nope, I have to reset it. Okay, so let's just say I have an antler grammar and I would like to generate a C-sharp parser for it. How can I do that? And um, yeah, again, it produces uh, some pretty us useful information. It's telling me that I have to use the antler tool. And then I have to run this command with the antler. Oh, and here we go. So the grammar should be specified in a G4 format. So let's take care of that. All right. Okay, now let's add a few more features to this language. So instead of def, I'd like to use module, as I mentioned before. So this is going to be called module. Uh, 
Uh, let me just put these at the top because I think I prefer them at the top. Does this even matter? I don't know. The order. I think the this one might have to be the first. Ah, it's fine. Just leave it at the bottom. Not that important. Okay, so um, instead of function, let's just call it module. Okay, so a module has um, the keyword module, followed by an identifier, followed by open parentheses, and then the, a list of arguments. But I, I would also like to be able to call constants. So, okay, let's see if we can get um, ChatGPT to do this for us. We have the following um, antler grammar. Can you add support for literals? And let's specify that I want for const okay for numeric constants in decimal binary octal and hexadecimal. Nice. So it added support for those. That's great. Yeah, and here we go. So, so an expression is made up of a primary and then uh, one of these operators. But yeah, it looks like it um, has the wrong operators. That's fine. We can uh, fix that. And then it also generated these numbers. So that's great. Let's. Uh, I'm just gonna take these. I don't um, need all of them. Okay, so let's uh, replace number with literal. I think that's a better name for it. And literal can be one of these. Or a binary number, or an octal number, or a hex number. All right, and then in aside the expression, we can either have identifiers or literals. But yeah, this also looks a bit wrong. What is this? Oh, okay, so a primary, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, one of the operands of this expression and it can either be an identifier, a literal or a, a sub expression. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. Okay, I wanted uh, to have it just the binary operators, so let's change that here. Um, did I miss any? Yeah, this one. Uh, in fact, uh, the tilde is a unary expression. Okay, so let's see if we can get it to generate unary expressions as well. Can you... Add support for unary expressions. Oh, come on, ChatGPT. <laughs> yeah, today it's just not feeling well. Um, when I tried this last, it worked much better. Okay, uh, let's do it ourselves because this is not that difficult. So... Okay, so what we can do here is to uh, yeah, I'm gonna create a separate 
rule for um let me just think a bit okay Yeah, so what I could do is instead of having it like this, I could add an or and have it contain tilde, which basically is means not. And that's basically it. Okay, so we have and, we have or, we have exclusive or, and now we also have not, which are some of, which are the basic ones. Okay, but it doesn't make sense to have this repeated, so I'm just going to remove that. Um, yeah, it's a bit strange. What I'm thinking about here is how, for example, uh, we might not be able to do something like using tilde without the parentheses um, in this case. And I'm thinking whether there is an easy, whether we can address that somehow. Okay, so primary can be an identifier, it can be a literal, GPT is down, oh, damn it. Is it down like completely? Yep, it's down. Ah, oh, so much for making a video about ChatGPT, right? <laughs> but it's okay, we can continue. Um, Yeah, I'm thinking about how to design this. Uh, okay, looks like I have to put a semicolon here. And I forgot about that. Um, I'm thinking about how we can create this grammar so that it can also accept uh, like tilde to be, to not be in a parentheses like this. Yeah, exactly, very convenient. Okay, uh, let's just leave it like this for now, and we're going to think about this more a bit later. All right, now, um, about adding the return type. So I was thinking of using this arrow thing and then having a list of return variables. Okay, so whenever we define a module, uh, we are going to have uh, the arguments in the parentheses. And then we're going to have an optional part. Uh, in fact, it's not going to be optional. It's going to be mandatory. Uh, and then we will have the arrow. Followed by the list of arguments. And here we can just uh, reuse this. Okay, so that it will be at least one argument followed by comma followed by um, another number of identifiers. And finally, we'll have a colon. And this looks pretty good. Okay, now in terms of statements, I have also added this um, syntax for defining variables. So let's also add support for that. So it can either be an, an assignment, an expression, or a variable declaration. Mm 
and a variable declaration will be var followed by an identifier. Um, yeah, and I haven't added support for arrays. And what I haven't done yet is also add support for this truth table thingy. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, and something else that I also want to have here is support for calling functions. We don't have that. What I'm thinking here is to move this to this primary. I'm not sure how uh, well it works with... Um, recursive um, expressions like this, but yeah, let's just try it and see. Okay, so a primary can be an identifier or a literal or uh, an expression inside these parentheses or tilde followed by another primary. So this is also an... Mm, okay, so the reason why this will not work is... No, it's actually gonna work. Okay, I think this looks pretty good. And let's also add support for calling functions. So identifier followed by followed by a list of expressions. And this is gonna be optional, followed by expression and a number of, an arbitrary number of expressions. So this means um, any number from zero to infinity. Okay, so, Let's clean this up a bit. Yep, I think this looks pretty good. So we can call functions. Uh, we can use this unary operator. Okay. Um, now, I also want to, it to have support for um, multiple assignments because these can have multiple outputs. So let's modify the syntax here as well, for adding support for that, followed by comma, followed by another identifier. and any number of them, followed by equals, followed by an expression. And an expression can either be this, a primary, or an expression containing. Yeah, this looks pretty good to me. Um, I don't have support for, uh, ver for arrays yet, but uh, let's just um, have it work with this and then we will try to add support for arrays later. Uh, it's a nice to have but uh, yeah, I'd like to move forward uh, and chat GPT seems to not work anymore, unfortunately uh, yeah this is unfortunate because now we have to search for things manually this was the whole point of the video, right? Okay, so let's go to the website of Antler and just uh, download the C Sharp stuff. Download C Sharp. And here's a guide on how to do this for C Sharp. Okay, that's great. And how do I download this? OK. 
Okay, so we have downloaded the author tool. And now um, let's just copy it to our work directory. And I need Java. I'm not sure if I have Java installed. Nope. Let's install Java. Um, nope, not Oracle. I'm not going to download Oracle. Uh, I think there is one from uh, like the Eclipse Foundation called Adoptium. Okay, uh, let's just get does it mention which Java version I need? I don't see any mention of that. Yeah, anyway, let's just get the latest. Hope this works. All right. Now let's see what the syntax for this was because I don't remember it. Um, so I don't see any. Okay, let's just search how to use this tool. Am I too quiet? Yeah, it sounds good. Great. Uh, okay. Getting started. Okay, so I've created my grammar and now I want to generate. Is this what I'm looking for? Okay, so D, uh, we have to use minus D language. Right, minus the language equals C sharp. And what else? And then the G4 file, so grammar.g4. Okay. It was a complete surprise to me. Let's see what came as a complete surprise. Line 36. Okay, why is it a surprise? It's not happy with this. Hold on a second. What the hell is this? I don't want uh, I don't want a comma. Let's just delete that. So a uh, decimal number, I don't want uh, fractional numbers. I don't want All right. It cannot generate C# -sharp code as of version 4.11.1. What? Oh, okay, so it doesn't like that the name is different and then C sharp is probably called differently. Let's see if ah, yeah, we have to rename the file. So let's just call this circuit lang and Mm -hmm. 
Hmm, cannot generate C sharp code. Why is that? I don't see any guide here on how to generate. Okay. Maybe this article will help us. Um, open AI is still down, unfortunately. Yeah, it's still not working. Okay, here uh, it's saying about using a specific Visual Studio Code extension, but I don't want to do that. I just want to use the Antler tool to generate. How can how hard can that be? Oh, come on. Nobody is saying how to generate. Let's just search for the error. Maybe this will help. Okay, so this should work. Oh, maybe it's case sensitive. That's stupid. Yay, we have our little parser. Oh, well, that's a lot of files. But yeah, the main ones are these. Uh, we don't care about the interp files. At least for now. All right. Uh, now let's create a C sharp project for this, and let's create a new project. Um, let's do a console app for now. Maybe. In fact, let's just start. Yeah. Okay. Console app is fine. Okay. Um, what should I call it? Circuit Lang Simulator. Okay, let's um, let's use. Oh, I wanted to do this in Dotnet four. C sharp Windows. Ah, uh, there's so many new templates. It's kind of making it hard to find. All right. Okay, now I'm going to move everything inside this project folder. And let's include these in our projects. Um, I think I just need to add the C-sharp files. 
Okay. And then another step for generating C sharp code was to add, um, yeah, so there was a runtime reference that I have to add. Let's look it up. Sampler for runtime. I think this is the one we need. Yay, and now we have no more errors. That's great. Ah, I wish there are still some errors here. Okay, and what I think I need to do now is to implement the rest of these. Hi, thank you for the kind words. I, we have quite a few errors here. I wonder if there's something I did wrong. Okay, so how do I get started? All right. Should we use this no listener or what does that mean? You visit the parse tree using a custom listener. You visit the parse tree using a custom visitor. Yeah, okay, so we probably want to have that. All right, how do I create and run a custom listener? Okay, and it has generated one of these listeners for us. And I will have to generate a class that looks like this. Okay, let's try to do that. So, uh, okay, so what exactly am I trying, what exactly am I doing here? That's kind of what I'm trying to figure out. Key and value. Okay, let's put this code here for a minute inside forum. Is this the wrong package? Okay, let's let's try to liquid up again. I think I might get the might have gotten the wrong package. So there's the sampler for runtime and there's also the standard version. Okay, let's just okay, so this is the dotnet core version. Okay, this one should also work with .NET Framework. So let's just try this one. Installed, oh.
that's odd. I'm not seeing it in the references, even though it says that it's installed. Let's see if using this one will fix all our errors. No, we still have some problems. Okay, these are just some warnings. We can ignore them. Ah, okay. And now we need the Lexer, which is circuit lang Lexer. And then parser is circuit lang parser. Okay. Start rule as. Okay, why is that? Why does it have start rule? Hmm. Source. Okay, this is just the source code of the entire C sharp runtime. It has some tests. Okay, that's not very useful. Yeah, my stream's usually lost, like two or three hours. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how this antler works and how to get it to work with C Sharp. And I'm having some um, difficulty with it. Why parse three start rules? And why doesn't the start rule function exist? That's odd. Yeah, so this is the only error that we have left, which is great, but how do I fix it? What am I doing wrong? Okay, so the start rule is, I think it's the name program. Yep. So uh, that, that's what wasn't very clear to me. So essentially it's generated a bunch of rules. Uh, let me just show you. Okay, so it basically generated a parser and it will have all these things that we generated here. So it has statement, it will have expression, it will have primary expression yep it has all the rules all the rules appear as uh, functions inside this parser and now we want to call the top level parser which in our case is program so that's what um that start rule meant and now this should generate a tree for us uh let's try to print something and see what we get to string tree console dot write and let's see what we get from this little program that we wrote earlier uh yeah now uh, something i haven't added is support for these um variables here uh for these uh array types and i think it might be a good idea to add them right now okay so 
um yeah we want an identifier to be followed by uh, i'm gonna create a new rule called identifier or array um, with array and the idea here is that it will have an identifier and optionally an open bracket uh, then a decimal number followed by a close bracket and this is going to be optional so this will specify that it is a an array and now we can use this everywhere so identify with the array here and also here Uh, for the return types, yes, we want that. We want it there as well. Okay, then for the statements, uh, it, yep, we still want the array here, followed by equals expression, and the expression can be, yep. So we can either use an identifier or an identifier with an array. Thing. So let's add support for that as well. And here as well. And now we have to regenerate this grammar. So Okay, now let's read on this jar command. And hopefully this will add support for yep okay so identifier with the race right here great okay so now let's have the first argument of this program be the input so let's just do file dot read all text um, okay so this is a char stream and I think we can use from a stream and let's do this nicely uh, using var file source open read args of zero Okay, and now let's try to deep. Let's just run this once and see what happens. So let's go to debug, and I'm going to add. Uh, yeah, it might be a good idea to save this somewhere. Okay, I haven't added support for this truth table thing, and I think I might have to do that as well. Um, okay, so let's save sample dot cl. Let's just use cl circuit slang. That looks pretty fine to me. All right, let's just copy the path, full file path to clipboard, and we're gonna provide it as a command line argument. And let's try to debug and see what happens. Now, obviously. Okay, and we're getting some uh, token recognition error. Um, you know what? Let's add support for comments. Because I don't think we have that. Um, let's see, is ChatGPT back or not? Oh no, it's still not working for me. Adding comment. Yep, 
Yeah, let's just use Google because Bing is not that great. Hmm, okay, so we can just do another rule, kind of like this white space rule here that just says line comment. And we're just gonna use the pound sign um, all the way until the next end of line and we will just skip this. Okay, uh, and now we should be able to comment some things that did not work here like this. Um, uh, let's just comment this whole thing. And let's see if this works. I'm gonna rebuild because the files changed. Okay, uh, we have an issue at line 13. Let's see what that's all about. Maybe it's something that we have forgotten to add. Mismatched input four, expecting decimal number. Did I mess this up? Okay, so a decimal number should be a number between zero and nine at least. Hmm, why is that? Mismatched input four, expecting deck number. I don't see why it is wrong. This should work. I don't understand why it is wrong. And we have that at up sixteen which is where this one expecting a deck number and then at four here expecting a deck number position 22 huh, hold on 16 okay so it's not seeing this open parentheses for some reason why is that At position 16, we have the open parentheses. So why is it not recognizing it? Open parentheses, followed by a decimal number, and then followed by a closed parentheses. This is odd, this is weird. Maybe it's generated mismatched input. Do we need to debug through it? Uh, something's old here. I'm not sure what exactly. Let's uh, let's take a look at these other files that it generated. Maybe they can explain to us what it's thinking. Okay, I don't see anything useful here.
Ah, ok. So we have the module name, right? We have mod the module keyword followed by the identifier, followed by an open parentheses, and then the list of arguments. And this looks good so far. Now, identifier with array means an identifier, in our case A, followed by open parentheses, and we have that here, followed by a number, and then followed by a close parenthesis. I don't understand why it's not working. Okay, let's see if um, this looks good to us. Uh, let's see what this tree looks like. So. Okay, we have um, tree. Yeah, so it basically generated an abstract syntax tree for us. And I'm trying to figure out uh, what it is, it, does it contain? Okay, so the first child is this uh, module, and the module has as children module, and then adder four, then the open parentheses, then what is this identifier with an array? So this thing which contains the token a. Followed by open parentheses. Yeah, the, I mean the grammar, uh, what the um, abstract syntax tree that it generated, it looks good. I'm not sure why it's giving me that error, but the syntax tree looks pretty good to me. All right, so um, uh, let's continue. Uh, let's move on and see how we can parse this syntax tree. And uh, basically, um, emit some way of find a way to simulate this now the way I'm thinking about how to do this um, is to go through all the modules uh, basically going through all the statements and building a directed graph so for example let's say that we have uh, this code here Um, okay, let's not create an adder. Let's just have a something very simple. Let's have this very simple module here. Um, let's start with this, which is very simple. And uh, we want to simulate this circuit. And how would we do that? Well, the idea would be to do it kind of like this. So uh, we start by going through this abstract syntax tree and we find module, we find this end module. Now, um, something that I like to have is to be able to mark this as the entrance point of this program. So just like in C, you have the main function, which is the main entry point. Um, let's add a keyword in this language that can specify that this is um main module so main is optional and main is just contains the keywords main the main keyword all right and we have to uh, regenerate this Oh, okay, now it works. So I, what I think the problem was is that I didn't do rebuild. I just did build. And uh, maybe 
this doesn't work properly here. Uh, yeah, we're kind of making a harder to define language here. Yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. Okay, uh, now I'm feeling confident. Uh, this works very well. Okay, let's see how we can uh, create, make this. So I'm going to make this the main module. And the idea here is that the user will be presented with a bit of a user interface in which he can see A and B, which in this case are bits. So these will be just two switches. And we are going to show that on the UI. And basically what we have here is kind of looks like this. So we have end module and it has one output and the result. And this will be like an LED that we will show in the interface. I think that's a pretty good way of representing this. Um, okay, and now how do we make this into a directed graph? Okay, so what we're going to do is we have these inputs, which are going to be tied to controls on the, in the simulator application probably bottoms or something like that um, and then we will have okay so let's just call this an input um, switch okay switch a and switch B and these will uh, both go towards this end module Okay, and now we uh, visit basically every uh, we visit every node from this, and we try to emit some code. And here we see that we are assigning to R. Okay, and here here we have and module, and then on the other side we have um, an indicator R. And now we kind of decompose this end module into the individual operations which make it up. In this case, we have A and B. So we just have to do A and B. So we would have an end operation where the first input is tied to A and the second input is tied to this B switch. Okay, now how do we simulate it? Uh, this is actually gonna be pretty simple. Uh, all we have to do is just go through the entire graph. Um, uh, now this will be in an infinite loop. Um, and basically whenever we see that the user is changing one of these, um, we will go through the entire loop and evaluate each of these operations. And finally, we will display through the indicator what has happened. Uh, yeah, so we have to change this program to make it with to add a GUI to it. That's great. Um, I think it's easier to just um. Okay, let's see. So the output type. Let's make this a Windows application instead of a console application. Uh, okay, now I like I'm gonna use WPF here. I think that's the easiest way of doing this. Uh, can I make this into a library? I think that might actually be easier. So I'm gonna make this project into a library, um, and then I'm gonna create a separate UI project. All right, and we are using the .NET framework. So we're still using the old frameworks, whatever, I don't care. Um, simulator main, simulator GUI or whatever. Okay, so now we don't have to do the, all of this manually. Um, let's check, is Jet GPT back? Can he help us with a couple of things? And you, hello. 
Okay, it's back. Yay! ChatGPT is back. Great. This is awesome. Okay, so let's ask ChatGPT to generate the user interface for us. Can you generate a XAML UI that has a toolbar with an open button and a run button? That has a toolbar at the top with an open button and a run button. In the main area, it should have so let's just make the UI really simple. Um, we're just gonna have a bunch of inputs on the left and a bunch of outputs on the right. It should have two list views. It should have two list views side by side. What? Come on, man. It's refusing to help. What the hell? Ah, uh, it's giving me just step by steps, which is annoying. Okay, here's an example of how this XAML UI might look. Exactly, this is what I want. Ah, come on. Yeah, I... It's not giving us the code anymore. Okay, we're gonna reset the thread and try again. Sometimes it usually works. Yeah, here you go. So if I create a new thread, then it helps. But sometimes it just refuses, which is kind of odd. Okay, so this looks great. It's generating a grid, uh, which is basically how you can create uh, the layout. It's a layout tool in XAML, and then putting a toolbar in the top row and um, second grid in the second row. And in this second grid, it's creating two columns, one on the left, one on the right. This looks great. This is actually what I wanted. Okay, and we're gonna paste that and here we go. And now we have the UI. Now for this list, um, uh, let's uh, see how we can build these switches. Um, list inputs and here will be list outputs okay now inside this um program class we had uh we called it a parser but we kind of wanted to do more with it okay now we want to visit Um, okay, so on the top level we have uh, this program rule, basically. Uh, this is going to be in the top of the tree and then it will be followed by a list of modules. So now we want to search for the module which has the main um, attribute set. Uh, but I think what we might want to do here is to go to basically visit this whole parse tree and generate our own model, our own classes that can work with that. So yeah, for that, I probably need to use uh, some of these listener thingies. Okay, so I need to create this parser listener and this will enter and exit Okay, whatever that means. My parse tree listener. Did it generate a listener for us? Let's see. 
Okay, so it generated this uh, circuit lang listener. Ah, this is awesome. So, essentially, every time we go through one of these nodes, one of these um, uh, things, one of these elements, it will basically call um, enter and exit functions for those. And I think we can use this to generate the um, abstract, you know, our own representation of this uh, syntax tree. Well, we're just going to build a little graph, a little directed graph here. Okay, so I'm curious what this class has. Okay, so this one has... Um, okay, so there are basically two um, passes here that I've noticed. In the first pass, it uh, calls these um, uh, this listener, but it also has the other thing, which is the... What is it? The visitor. I'm not sure what's the difference between them. You can visit the parse tree using a custom listener or a custom visitor. Okay, let's see if we can implement a listener. Okay, so it has created this uh, I circuit link listener for us. And this is just an interface. And now we want to create the actual implementation of this class. Mm. Okay, language listener. Yeah, but now we're gonna have a conflict with this class name, so we'll just call it something slightly else. Lang. Same, I don't know, tree builder. Graph builder listener, or whatever, it doesn't matter. And we are going to implement this interface. Okay, and we have a lot of nodes here. Now, what I'm curious if about is whether we can attach some information to this context dot Okay, so we have payload. Yeah, I think this might be what we need. I'm not sure. Uh, nope, it's not payload. Okay, so the way this would work in um, Bison uh, is... So, um, it would basically do something similar to this it would um, visit every node and whenever you are visiting a node you can basically return an object from that node but i'm not sure how to do that here maybe i not i'm supposed to use the other the visitor i'm not very familiar with handler i've never used it before but uh okay so here they are using the visitor yeah and i think this is exactly what we need and we need the visitor, not the listener. Okay. I think there's a command line option that I need to add. For it to generate a visitor for us. Uh, here we go. And let's refresh. And now we have this visitor. And this is exactly what we need. Okay, and instead of a listener, let's just rename this class to something like um, circuit lang um, model generator. And this one will implement the visitor. Uh, is this a base visitor? Oh, oh, and it also has a visitor. Hmm. 
And this is, okay, this is a class. Great. Um, it's a template. So we need to give it a result. We can just use object from C sharp, but uh, this will not be super nice. Um, yeah, ideally, let's create a folder called model. And let's create a little model for, I think object is fine. Okay, and let's create mod a class called module. And this will have a name. And it will have a list of inputs and outputs. Now, module will inherit from a base class called, uh, let's call this what, node. Okay, now a node also has a list of inputs. and of outputs. So this is going to be a uh, outputs. Okay. And let's make these public. Now, as I was talking about earlier, I kind of want to have like a In fact, let's just Keep this as simple as possible. Um, we're gonna have um, okay. Let me think about this uh, width. So the width is basically how many, uh, many bits it has. Uh, by default, this is gonna be one, but it can have multiple. And Let's create a function that evaluates its value. So, and let's use bit array, which is a great way of doing this. Um, value. Uh, okay, so. Uh, the way I'm thinking about this is uh, basically whenever we want to evaluate this node, what we're going to do is we're going to go over each of the inputs and we're going to get its value. And then we're going to do the operation that we want to do. And then we're going to put everything in the output. So that's kind of how it should work. So this is why I'm adding this value. Okay, and now a function called evaluate or visit or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, in the case of a simple node, uh, then, uh, so I'm thinking of using this class to represent variables. Uh, I think this is a great way of doing that. So if you are creating a variable, uh, you can basically reuse it multiple times. So the input will be how we are assigning this variable and the outputs, they will be linked to all the places where this variable gets used. Okay, so all we have to do is just, um, uh, we don't care about, okay, so if inputs dot count is smaller or equal to zero, then we can throw new exception. Um, invalid okay miss uh, node is missing inputs okay and then um for each of our output in outputs uh, we want to set the output 
uh, value, you want to set it to the input, the first input. So the first node value. So this is kind of how this simple node works. Okay, and we should make this virtual so we can override it. Now, uh, module. Uh, We'll also have a name and string is a bool is a main. And this will basically inherit from the node class. And visit Okay, now this is going to be a bit more complicated uh, because a node will basically con uh, a module uh, will basically contain a list of statements, and uh, we will probably have yeah, and we will go through each of these statements and then try to execute it. Um, I'm still thinking about how this should work. Uh, I think my initial idea where I um, so I basically am thinking of creating two internal representations. So the first internal representation is how we deal with the parsing the source code, right? Uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking here and to separate and to basically remove this visit and everything else and just keep it more simple. So we would have a module class, uh, which would contain a bunch of a field called um, statements and each statement would basically contain some code like declaring a variable or um, what else we had here um, an assignment and for creating variables what I'm thinking is to uh, basically, whenever we have this create variable, it's just going to create one of these nodes. Yeah, and then uh, we would have the runtime uh, model, which is where it would uh, convert all of these into uh, this directed graph where we can visit each node. Uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking of. It might be a bit more complicated, but I don't know. Yeah, okay, let's do that instead. So, module will have a name, a boolean is main, and it will have a list of statement. Uh, let's just make this a list so it's easier to work with statements and Okay, now let's generate this statement class. Okay, so a statement, uh, we can have two types of statements. Uh, we can have a variable declaration or an assignment. So yeah, this is just I statement internal um, public interface I statement. We don't even need a class for this. It's just going to be a marker class. It's not going to contain anything. And now let's create um, declaration, variable declaration statement. And this one will contain uh, the name of the variable and the width. Okay, gather and setter. And this one implements the I statement interface and for the second type of statement, which is an assignment statement. Uh, 
uh, what we have here is basically a list of inputs and a list of outputs. And um, the way we, okay, for this identifier with array, I would call this um, variable reference. So let's create that. Variable reference. And this can be variable name index, uh, which is should default to zero. Okay, so identifier with array. Uh, we have a name, the name of the identifier, and then we have the index. This would be the index. Uh, all right, and now inside variable assignment statement, we have the inputs. Um, the in, okay, the left, the left hand side. Let's just call it that. Uh, what's not correct? I think the class. Okay, so we have the left hand side and then we have the right hand side, which is going to be an expression. So let's create a class called uh, expression. All right. Okay, so let's try to integrate these that I made so far. And I will create some more. Uh, okay, uh, something that I haven't thought of is what if we have uh, this syntax with an assignment having multiple uh, things on the left side but not multiple things on the right side so i think we should be able to make a list of expressions here so i'm gonna change this up and do the same thing here followed by a comma followed by another expression and this can be any number of times and now we can have multiple expressions on either side yeah, uh, something that's going to be a bit more complicated. Uh, I think it's fine. Since um, modules basically can have multiple outputs. Yeah, okay. Let's regenerate this with the change. Okay, so a module can has a name, it can either be main or not the main module, and then it has a list of statements. And then we have all of these types of statements, and the most complicated one is going to be this assignment statement. Okay, now for this expression. How do we use this expression thing? Okay, so for us, an expression is basically a thing. Uh, I think we should go from... Okay, let's try to implement this visitor and then we will uh, come up with these as we go. So let's go to the model generator and let's implement this interface and let's start by visiting uh, okay Right. 
um, we can create another class called program and this one will just have a list list of modules okay and here on the top level whenever we visit this we are going to create a new program uh, from the model this is the one we need return new program we want to ah it doesn't have children oh we have to use a normal four oh no Okay, and that's not the right program class. Okay, let's just call this program two and move on. Okay, program dot modules, and we are going to add um, tree dot get child of i dot uh, accept maybe I'm not sure if this is the way to work but okay let's look at the documentation a bit more Base visitor. We can create our own visitor class and change what we need. Okay. Um, should I use this instead? Ah, okay. I should use this one instead. Yay. I can make this a lot better. Okay. So we're going to override this space class and Let's override visit uh, program. And uh, yeah, as I was writing before, we're going to create a new program. And now we have to add all the modules. So modules dot add. And let's see what we need to do to get those. of our module in context dot module and I think we need to visit that but I'm not sure how Okay, so let's see.
Okay, so you just call visit. That's it. And all we have to do is just call cast this to a module. And return program. Yeah, so this is kind of what we have to do for each one of these. Set module. Yeah, for a module, we kind of have the same thing. We're going to create a new module. And now we have to set the inputs and the outputs. Uh, but yeah, let's not use the node for now. Uh, let's simply use a variable reference. And list of variable references, which are the inputs. And same for the output. Okay, now let's go to visit module and now we have to parse all the inputs. So for each our input in context.input. Uh, okay, so uh, this is not called like this. Uh, okay, this is going to be a bit more complicated here uh, because uh, we have. Okay, let's start with the simple stuff. So if it has that main keyword. Um... Module dot is main equals whether this is different than null, I think. And then we need to see how we can obtain this argument list. Uh, yeah, what I think might be useful is to split this up into an argument list. And here we are going to put uh, all of this. Yeah, so we have a module argument list followed by a number of identifiers with arrays. And uh, this, we are replacing it with a module argument list. And then uh, return type list. So return output list. And this will also be just the same as this one. But it's not going to be optional. So it needs to have at least one. Okay, uh, let's regenerate the grammar. Mm, okay, unterminated rule, which one? Yeah, we need a semicolon at the beginning here. All right, all right. And now let's rebuild or refresh or whatever.
Okay, and when we visit a module, uh, what we can do is go to this child, this module argument list to go for the arguments. And we are interested in these identifiers with array. Okay. Similarly, we are going to do the same with the return. Uh, so I called it module output list and we are going to save the outputs and then we are going to do the same with those statements and we're going to visit all those statements And that's how we visit a module. And then we return this module. And yeah, this is basically how we need to implement our parser. Uh, I forgot to add the name. So module.name equals context dot um, module identifier. string our what is it um, to string yeah I think so uh, I'll have to debug a lot of this code to make sure it works Okay, let's uh, visit now this um, identifier with array. So, identifier with array. And here, uh, what we want to do is return a new variable reference with the variable name being the identifier and then the index being oh this decimal number if it exists uh, okay let's create some visitors for this as well so visit of this decimal number okay but if it's null then we are just gonna set it to zero so if context dot uh, decimal number is null then we will just set it to zero otherwise we will set it to we will visit this and uh, what am i missing Okay. Come on, what are, am I missing here? Do I have? Oh, I don't should not use the semicolon. All right. Um, let's also visit these. Um. Okay, I don't see in that case let's just visit terminal. Okay. And if node dot uh, okay, let's see. Symbol
Hmm. Okay, so this decimal number is a terminal node. So I need to be able to get the name of this. Do I not have the name? Okay, I will want to um, debug this a bit and see how, what it generates and see if this is going to work or not. So let's do that a little bit and I'm going to go to the main window. Let's um, implement the handler for this open button. We're going to create a new dialog. Okay, and filter will be CL, and this is going to be called um, circuit lang file. Okay, result equals dialog dot show dialog and if result dot has value and result dot value then uh we are going to basically do everything we did here inside this program. I forgot to also add the using statement. Okay, we need to add a reference to the other project. And now this error should go away. Okay, so how do we call this visitor? circuit lang uh, model generator did I not name this class this way okay it should be public not internal and let's visit the tree and i'm really curious what uh, this will produce and so let's put a breakpoint here and try to go through some of these okay we have some syntax error ah, okay Not all code paths return a value. Okay, we need to return something here, and I think that's it. Yep. And set this as the startup project, and let's run this. How are you guys doing? Are you doing great? Is this interesting what I'm doing here or is it just boring? I would really appreciate some feedback. Sample, okay. Hmm, 
Why is it not seeing it? Sample.cl. That's odd. Anyway, okay, so now we are going to call this visitor. Okay, and let's debug a bit through each of these functions and see what happens. I'm really curious if this works and how well it works and so on. All right. Okay, so it looks like we are starting with module. Okay, is main equals true. So we have this um, module and we have this context and Okay, let's see if this works. So the name and the module. Yep, that's perfect. This is exactly what I needed. Okay, and now we're going to visit each of these identifiers and we're going to try to create a new variable identifier. And it looks like we are getting this um, identify return a and then uh, deck number return null because uh, this doesn't exist it's null. okay and I think this looks good uh, let's see what we get okay so now we have one input which has the index 0 and a variable name a yep this looks pretty good and this um, this function has two parameters a and b that looks great and same with the output so yeah I've seen that this works and now the statements now for the statements I haven't implemented that visitor so I'm not sure what if this will do anything okay and now we are in visit terminal and here I want to see more properties about this node and let's see if we can find any symbol we have a channel a column a token source token type yeah okay I think this is the one we need so we need to check the token type and node dot um, so uh, what is it um, symbol dot type and the token types we should have them somewhere not sure where maybe here or maybe not okay we have them here so we have them in the lexer defined and the token type 8 I think it was the token type 8 uh, yeah okay this is not helpful but what I'm interested in is this uh, decimal number, binary number, and so on. So we can parse them. Okay, so if we encounter a decimal number, then we want to return. Uh, we want to parse the number. So node dot uh, get text. Yep, that's what we want. Get text and int dot parse of this and yeah if we cannot find anything we're just gonna call base dot visit terminal okay uh, let's do the same for the other type of numbers uh, for hex number And we're going to parse the text um, starting from uh, 2, index 2. So the first two characters will be um, 
zero x and followed by the rest of it and now we also want to parse it into hex let's see how we can do that um now something i'm also thinking about here is that uh, this might be a i don't know what kind of number might this be um whether we should use like a bit array uh no we should not and the way we should implement for example the operations is whenever we see a variable we know exactly how wide it is but when we see a constant we don't really know how wide it should be so we will just adapt it to whatever number we have uh, to whatever variable we have okay so how do i yeah, let's ask um, ChatGPT for some more information about how to how to parse a hex number in C sharp. Okay, so we have to use the convert dot to int thirty two. That's basically it. Okay, and the base is going to be 16. Okay, for an octal number, we are going to do basically the same thing, but the base is 8. And for a binary number, the base is just 2. Okay, now this should basically give us a number out of um, these. Let's see, are there anything else that we should um, look at? Module main identifier comment. We don't care about the comments. Yeah, I think this is perfect. This is this is all that we need here. Okay, uh, now let's see how we can parse the expressions um, because those are going to be the more complicated part, the statements. Is it statement? Okay, let's take a look at our grammar. So for a statement, it can either be an assignment, an expression, or a variable declaration. All right. Uh, in fact, I think I can modify this because expression might not make sense. Yeah, this doesn't make sense. Uh, we either want just a variable declaration or an assignment. Um, in fact, visit statement, um, we don't have, we might. Okay, so uh, in order to visit this statement, what we have to do is check if we have a, um, if we have an assignment, so if context of the assignment is different than null, return visit that assignment. Else we're gonna visit the other one, which is the variable declaration. Okay, and now we have to visit assignment. Okay, and for an assignment, we basically have a, a left side and a right side and 
on the left and on the right. We just visit each one and add them to the list. Context dot. Um, okay, so for the left hand side, uh, let's take a look at our grammar here. For our left hand side of the assignment, we have these identifier with arrays, and on the right -hand side, we have the expressions. So that's all we have to do identifier with array. Okay, and we want to visit that left hand side. And we're gonna, this should be a variable reference. And for the right hand side, which are these expressions? Uh, we're just going to add them to the right hand side like this and return this assignment. Okay. So this is how we visit the assignment. Next, uh, the variable reference, we've already found that. Uh, we have to do the expression now. Hello. Uh, have I created the expression class? Yes, I have. Okay, um, so let's take a look at our uh, expressions here. So what we have here is a list of um, things on the left. Okay, so we have a list of these primary things followed by an operator um, followed by another primary thing. So I think here we have to parse it uh, one by uh, it, we have to parse each token. So let's see how we can do that. Yeah, so we have to visit all the children. Okay, now... Um, how... Do we parse these children? Let's see. Uh, so first we're gonna visit. Um, so if this child dot uh, um, okay, so if this is how can I tell whether this okay get type? Nope, not get type. Okay, let's uh, print them and see what we can get from that. Okay, let's run this program. Uh, yeah, I forgot to return. Expression. And then let's run this and see what happens. Here. Maybe I'm not doing this right. Okay, so I've opened the file and now we are uh, going into the visit. Uh, do I have any other breakpoints? No. So we should just come straight here. Okay, so this first child is what a 
yeah, something I find kind of odd here is how can I tell that this um what type is this child? Okay, so it's something of okay, so it's a primary context. Yeah, okay, great. So what we should have here in this list of children is a list of uh, these primary things and followed by uh, one of these tokens, one of these operators. Okay, so uh, let's create a class called a uh, bit uh, binary operation and here we need to have uh, basically two of these primary things right Okay, so let's create an interface for an operand. Okay. And this will have two operands, so... Um, left and one on the right. Okay, and it will also have an operator, so let's just use a char for that. I mean, we can theoretically use an enum, but it's fine. Let's just uh, use a char here. Uh, all right. Uh, so this uh, is a list, and what we're trying to do is... Um, uh, basically create a list of okay I think I I can see a better way of doing this expression um, let's let's re let's redesign this expression a bit so to make it easier to work with so what I'm thinking here is, uh, okay, what can be an expression? Um, simply, so what I want to do is simply remove this primary thing completely. So an expression can be an identifier with an array. That's one thing it can be. Uh, then it can be a literal. Yes, we've seen that. Uh, it can be um, a, an expression within a parenthesis. This is another valid uh, option. Uh, then it can be a binary, um, a binary, what is this? A binary operation or a unary operation. Okay, what else? And it can also be a module call. So this is basically calling a module. Okay, and let's define this binary operation. So a binary operation is essentially uh, two expressions with a symbol between them, one of these. Expression operand, uh, okay, operator, and then another expression. Okay, and since an expression can be, uh, we'll see how if something I'm kind of curious about is how it will handle. Uh, how it will handle this. We'll see if it works. 
Okay, and unary operation will be um, an unary operand, unary operator followed by an expression, and an expression can be anything. Okay, and let's simply eliminate this primary thing because I just don't like it. Okay, what are the binary operators? Uh, we have a couple of options. We have uh, end, uh, we have or, and we have um, exclusive or. And the unary operators are, for now, we just have tilde, which is means not. Okay, let's uh, regenerate the grammar. Reference to undefined rule module call. Yeah, I forgot about this one. So a module call is essentially an identifier. So let's see, uh, an identifier followed by open parentheses followed by an argument list but this argument list is going to be a list of expressions okay um yeah so i'm gonna take the parentheses open parentheses then uh here we're gonna have a list of expressions so an e expression followed by a comma, optionally by a comma, followed by another expression. And this can be any number of times, and this can be optional. Okay, so basically what I'm seeing here is that uh, this can be uh, an expression followed by optionally, a comma, expression, comma, expression, comma, expression, etc. And everything can be optional. Okay, let's regenerate our grammar. Okay, we are missing a semicolon here. And okay, the following set of rules are mutually left recursive expression and binary operation. And this is an error. Okay, and how can we fix that? I wonder how we can fix that. Our mutually left recursive. Uh, let's see how we can fix that. Uh, let's ask ChatGPT for uh, its Visual Studio, the ID. Have um, this error in an Angular script. How can I fix it? Okay, and this is great. It's explaining to me why I am making why this thing that I did is not good. The rule rule is left recursive because it directly calls itself on the left side of the production. This is not allowed in Antler and you will see the mutually left recursive error if you try to compile this grammar. To fix this issue, uh, you need to remove the left recursion from your grammar. So all it did is simply move this Okay, uh, let's try something else. Um, uh, let's try to ask it to fix our own code. Um, can you fix this for me? Where I'm getting... I'm 
getting this error for expression and binary operation. Can you fix this for me? Let's see if we can fix it. The expression rule calls the binary operation rule on the right side of the production and the binary operation rule calls expression on the left side of the production. Okay, let's see how Hmm, okay, so I think that's kind of why it created that primary expression thing to deal with this. But I'm not sure how this can fix it. Okay, uh, let's try to find a solution online because this is not helpful for me. Okay, this is exactly the situation. Hmm, okay, so if he moves expression here, then the error goes away. Okay, then we will do exactly this. So instead of having this separate uh, binary operation rule, we're just gonna integrate it here. And same for the unary one. In fact, for the unary one, it should be fine. It's just the binary operation that's having issues. All right. Yeah, okay. And let's refresh this and rebuild our code. And now, um, whenever we visit this uh, expression, uh, we have to handle it a bit different. So if this is an if child is identifier with array, then we will just return visit this uh, child. If it's a literal, uh, we will do the same. Uh, okay, let's um, look into this a bit again. All right. So the first child it has the type uh, X. Okay. Expression context. Okay, so our current context has the type expression context and our first child has also expression context. So yeah, in that case, we just um, call this recursively. Context 
Uh, what else can we do? Uh, we can do the same with unary operation and module call. Module call context or child is parser dot um, unary operation operation context. Okay, so uh, we've handled this one. Uh, we are going to handle litter right now, which can be one of these. Okay, and then we have this open parentheses expression, and then we have the binary open. Yeah, so we can tell which one uh, this expression is. Um, Okay, um, uh, I think we need, uh, can we identify which one of these cases this is? This might be interesting. Okay, so uh, maybe it's this get alt number. Uh, debug dot right line with that get alt number. I think this might actually contain which rule from the list of rules. Uh, let me see. Okay, so let's try to run this again. And here we have the application. Uh, I think I I stopped that filter because it's not showing the CL file, but yeah, that's okay. So uh, let's see what it printed. We don't have the console, we have it here. Okay, so this one is zero. Uh, and I think the rule for the zero rule is Identifier with array. Hmm. Uh, so we have this expression which has a and b. So this should be should fall into this case here. I'm not sure how to tell which case this is. Rule index. Yeah. Okay. That's the one we need. Switch um, context dot rule index. Okay, and if we have the zeroth rule, then we just need to call uh, visit with this identifier with array. So uh, case zero, and we can actually add the comment here to make this more clear. Uh, and we just care about the first child because we should only have one child. Okay, if this is the second rule, then we have a literal and we also visit it. Yep, so uh, for this is the literal rule. Uh, then we have rule number two, which is open parentheses, a sub expression, and then another open parentheses. And for that, yes, we just visit that sub expression. That's basically it. Nothing complicated here. Okay, if we have a binary operator, then what we have to do is uh, basically evaluate the expression for both of these and then create an operator rule from here. So return new operation, a binary operation, and on the left we will have 
visit of context. Okay, now this is expecting um, something that implements the IO current interface, so we're just gonna cost it. Okay, and what am I missing here? Cannot convert from I operand to parse tree. Oh, okay, so. Yeah. I put the cost in the wrong place. Okay, same with the second operation. And we want the operator to be context.get child of one dot get text uh, let's actually make this a string this way we can support um to you know uh two character operin operators without any issue okay case four so the next case is this unary operation thingy. And in this case, uh, we just visit it because uh, we should have Okay, and for the module call, uh, we visit it as well. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. Um, I hope this works. Um, did I, do I, should I do this in other places as well? Let's see. Uh, for the statement. Yeah, this should be fine uh, we can use the ruby index here as well but i think it's fine this way uh this is where i actually needed to check the ruby index because there are a lot of rules here all right um okay we have the unary operation and then module call uh, let's create some classes to model these uh, unary operation And we're gonna have uh, an operator, so operator and the operand. So the operand will be a what? An x an i operand. Okay, I forgot to make this interface public. And I think I might, might have forgotten a few other things to make public. In binary operation. Okay, this looks good. Okay, now, um, a unary operation, is it an operand? Yes, it is. What else is an operand? So an operand is essentially kind of like a sub-expression, you could say. Uh, let's add it for binary operation as well. Uh, let, in fact, we don't even need this expression anymore. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this expression class completely. And I'm going to rename I operand to I expression. Uh, what else can be an expression? Um, what? Another one can be an assignment. Okay, this is not an expression. A binary operation is an expression. A statement is an expression. A variable reference is an expression. And uh, what else can be an expression? Uh, we can also have 
the okay uh unary operation i've added that a uh, binary operation um what else am i missing here the module call yeah let's do the module call as well okay module call and this is also an expression okay so a module call will have a module name and then it will have some expressions for the inputs and that's basically it um, okay let's just uh, initialize it like this okay uh, let's go back to our model generator and this should be an i expression now we have to change a few things here uh, we should change this these numbers to be a literal uh, let's create a class called literal which can also be an expression and it just has a value and here uh, let's instead of doing this let's create a new literal with um, the value equal to this okay uh, yeah and I'm gonna do the same thing for all the rest Okay, and same with the binary number. Okay, did I miss anything? Um, literal, okay, it does implement the I expression, which is great okay and here uh nope we don't need any expression to instantiate uh, we're just gonna visit the child nodes uh okay um what we haven't done yet is this unary operation and the module call uh visit unary operation and here we have a single rule um and we're gonna return a new unary operation on the left hand side yeah i mean this is gonna have i expression visit of context dot uh, get child of one and the operator will be the first child. So child of zero, and we're gonna convert that to get text. Mm -hmm. Okay, what did I do wrong? Okay, we don't need to visit anything. Uh, we're just gonna get the text and no semicolon and semicolon here okay um i think i did i use to string at some point okay let's just call get text instead of to string because that's the correct method okay i think we are almost done uh yeah there's one more uh, module
Okay, and for the module call, what we want to do is create a new module call object. And okay, with module name being the uh, identifier. Uh, dot get text so that would be the module name and for the inputs uh, we need to go through all the children uh, we need to go through these expressions module call dot add or inputs dot add and we're gonna use these expressions so i expression visit of expression and let's return this module call all right i think we are done i think we might be done i'm really curious what this will generate Let's close everything and only open this here. Now we don't have any two string function inside this object, but um, program object, but let's see what we generate. Let's see what we get by running this program. Okay, open sample file and as the output we have a program yay that's this works perfectly and this program has one module because we commented the rest and this module is called end module its main yes um, it has two inputs a variable a and a variable b great um, then it has one output which is variable r that's awesome okay let's see it has one statement and this is an assignment statement um, yes it is an assignment i can confirm that and let's see on the left hand side we have this variable reference to variable r of index zero so yes this is correct and on the right hand side we have this um, okay maybe this did not work properly uh, we have a variable reference to b um, yeah something did go wrong here because this should not be it it should be uh let's debug this a bit and see what we what is happening uh let's go to our model generator and what i think the problem might be is maybe the rule index this rule index or something uh let's see did i do something wrong here because this should be a binary operation not whatever it generated there okay and i'm gonna open the source file again okay and now we are visiting this expression okay uh let's call expression dot uh, context dot get text let's see what we get so a and b this is basically our expression and rule index says we are on rule seven hmm what the hell why where did it get seven from it should be this one one two three four five six seven is that it maybe it's not rule index um 
Oh. Um, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Minus 1, yeah. So the rule index is the index in the grammar. It's not what I thought it meant. Um, okay. So, um, hmm, okay. It has three children. We can tell that. Invoking state. Um, child count is three. Um, I don't see any useful information here. Let's try something else. Let's see if it has, maybe it has a function that I'm not sure what it means. Okay. Okay, it has this get alt number, which in our case is zero, not very helpful. I don't think that's what we want. Uh, get token. Uh, yep, that's not what I want. Rule index doesn't seem to be what I want. Okay, how can I tell which rule it is? Let's see. I don't want Bing. Okay, exactly. So uh, Okay, so it looks like it may not be possible, which is unfortunate. I mean, this is kind of stupid. We don't need labels. Yeah, this is what the alt number should mean, but for some reason it doesn't. And there's some way of uh, doing it manually by um, overriding that class. Yeah, this kind of sucks, but um, I mean, Um, okay, let's see if we can use this alt number solution somehow. So I can add a class my context that's derived from parser rule context. Set the options in the grammar. Context superclass is my context. And then I override the set alt number function and get alt number. Okay, but how will I determine which of those rules it would be? <laughs> Antler 
Um, this is something that sucks. Bot handler. I mean, seriously, why not give me a way to identify which of the Zul in the list of Oros I've used? This is kind of stupid. All right. Um, yeah, I guess we can rewrite this function a bit. Um, so we can... Okay, so if... Uh, the first case is going to be pretty simple. So if context.identifier with array different than null, then we will just visit this identifier with array. Visit of that. Okay, and we've covered this one. Now the literal one. Uh, we're going to do the same. We're just going to visit that literal. Um, okay, then we have this one. For this one, I kind of have to check if, so if context dot um, get child of zero is I a terminal node can i do that then i'm probably in this case here so if it's not a literal then i'm probably in this case here so um Okay, and if the terminal, okay, if it starts with an open parentheses. Yeah, this way we can be sure that we are in the right case. Okay, and then we have the binary operation. Dot uh, expression dot length is two then we are in the binary operation case in which case we are gonna do this okay and here uh, we can just use expression of zero and expression of one and binary operator dot get text. Okay, uh, then I have unary operation and module call. These should be pretty easy to do, same as we did the other ones. So if context dot unary operation is different than null, then we will visit the unary operation. And finally, we have the module call. Um, we're going to visit that module call. And if everything else failed, we're just going to return base dot visit expression. Now this should probably not do anything. Uh, have I used rule index anywhere else? Nope. Okay, let's try again and see what we get.
All right. Uh, yeah, I forgot to put a break here. Oh, let's do that again. Open, say anything, load anything, and our file. And let's see if we got destroyed this time. Okay, we have one module, which is domain module. And in statements, we have an assignment. On the right hand side, we have a binary operation, which has variable a and then a variable b. Yay! We have successfully created this. Um, yeah. Uh, something I'd like to do is add support for uh, this. Um, a tooth table that I was thinking of here. All right, so uh, let's add support for the truth table. Uh, the truth table, I can consider it another type of expression. It's just like a module call, but instead it's called truth table. Okay, and now let's go and write the uh, rule on how to parse this. All right. Let's make this a bit smaller and okay uh, truth table uh, let's add this here at the bottom so a truth table will be composed of the truth table constant and followed by this syntax that we used for module calls so it will be identical but it will have it will need to have at least one expression it cannot have zero so let's not allow zero okay so expression followed by comma followed by ex any number of comma expressions followed by nothing else so close parentheses Okay, and then we have the open brackets. And then here uh, we define these using literals. So, in fact, uh, yeah, it's fine to use any type of literal. I think it's fine to use the binary hex or whatever. So, any type of literal should be fine. Okay, and let's follow this by a list of um, yeah let's follow this by a list of um, these things um, so let's call this truth table entry entry and we can have any number of them followed by closed bracket. Okay, so the truth table keyword, then open parentheses, then the list of arguments, which can be any type of expression, followed by open um, bracket, a, a list of truth table entries, followed by Um, closed bracket. Okay, now a truth table entry will look like this. Um, so we have a list of literals. Literal followed by any number of comma followed by another literal. Um, followed by colon followed by another one of these so this will be for the outputs uh, okay now something that I might 
create us an issue here is um, something I'm noticing is that our all the white space is marked as skip. So this is not actually Python like uh, because of that. Um, I'm not sure how if we could force it to have a new line, but maybe we can. Okay, uh, we've done this for the line comments, so we are forcing it to have a new line, right? So, yeah, let's try to add this to the truth table entry. So, after all of these, it has to be followed by a new line. And maybe this will work. I don't know. We will see. All right, uh, let's regenerate our grammar. Mismatched input, expecting semi while matching a rule at line 42. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, um, let's create a new line. I think it's expecting followed by new line. I think that's that should fix it. I think the uppercase ones mean that it's like a token and this is a regular expression that you can use to parse to get this token. And here, uh, these are the semantic rules and it is expecting this to be a token type, not a regular expression. I think that's the reason why it didn't work. Okay. Hmm, okay. We get more errors. So, unterminated rule. Oh, okay. That's a simple fix. And unterminated rule at line 51. Um, line 51. Okay, the new line. It's the new line. Uh, let's make this look a bit nicer. Um, yeah, this actually looks a lot nicer than it used to. Okay, and I think we should be good now. Yep. Okay, uh, so let's add support for these um, truth table thingies. So let's add in our model truth table. And as we've seen, uh, this truth table is also an expression so we can um, add the i expression interface and this is going to be very similar to the module call so i'm going to copy in fact we only need the inputs uh, all right and then the entries Okay, and let's also generate this uh, truth table entry class. And a truth table entry will have um, basically a list of inputs and a list of outputs. Uh, something I was thinking about here is uh, that there are cases where we don't care about the output and uh, we should be able to put a, one of these here, um, thinking that it might be a good idea. So, and it will also help us uh, in another way, I will show you in just a moment, because um, okay, and let's also create literal or wild card 
which will be literal or this question mark because now we can use um, literal to get all the stuff on the left side and literal or wild to get all the stuff on the right side uh, you will see in the visitor in just a moment let's regenerate and let's go to the code okay and here uh, we can use int question mark so we can use the nullable int for the outputs all right now let's go into our model generator and let's also take care of this particular case uh, we have one more case here which is truth table and we also have to create a new method for visiting the truth table and what we are going to do here is we are going to return a new truth table um, okay uh, let's create a local variable input in uh, context dot it has these um, expressions inputs dot add pass to an ix expression of visit of that input okay and now for the entries which are entry in context dot entry truth table entry and we are just gonna call the visit function again for that entry and we're gonna cost it to a truth table entry mm -hmm. okay what it, uh, okay so entries and return truth table and finally the last function in our parser will be visit uh, the entry that truth table entry thingy okay and here we are going to generate uh, entry equals new truth table entry and we're gonna return that okay and here we have to specify the inputs and the outputs and here we go for it okay um let's create an array for inputs equals new int of let's see how many um okay so we had two things we have literals which are the inputs and literal or wild which are the outputs so let's do literal dot length and now we're gonna parse these literals in context dot literal inputs of uh yeah we have to use indices okay inputs of i equals context um okay so we're gonna get a literal from the visit function so we're gonna go uh, call visit of context dot literal of i okay and that will give us a literal and all we want is the value okay and for the outputs we're going to do the same literal for wild and here
Okay, if uh, it is a wild card, so if uh, context dot literal of i dot get text equals that wild card, then the outputs of i is simply null, and otherwise uh, outputs of i equals the same thing as we did the last time. Okay, I think this looks good. And now let's set the inputs equal inputs and output equal outputs. And we should have this entire file should be parsable now. And let's remove this comment line and see if this works. All right. Hmm, okay, so we get got an error here, which is odd. Okay, so inputs dot okay. So why is this null then? Context dot literal. Okay, so this one should give us um this zero, then another zero, and then another zero what uh so what is null here object reference not set to an instance of an object What's going on? Is it a problem here? Okay, uh, let's try to rerun this code. Okay, so now we have reached our first input and we are gonna try to visit it and what i expect is for it to get into this visit terminal function uh, let's see if we get here and the terminal we get is has the symbol uh, 23 23 is none of these. Uh, you know what I think I should do? Uh, I think I should make this literal or wild lowercase. Or wild. And not have it be a constant, because I think that's creating some issues for me. All right, uh, let's see. Regenerate and now uh, if we go to refresh and now we're gonna get some errors here. Okay, now this is not gonna be a terminal thing anymore. And I think this is the issue we had before. Okay, so Um, okay. Uh, let's see if this works. I have no idea if I should also override the function for liter the visit function for literal or wild, but we will see. Um, okay, let's rebuild and try to debug this.
Um, yeah, once we get this running, I think we should... Um, all that's left to do is just um, the simulation part. Okay, we are still getting this null reference exception. Which I'm not sure why is it is happening. Okay, so let's try to go... Uh, I is zero. Okay, so I think... Uh, let's try to restart this. Okay, uh, so now we are trying to visit this uh, literal thing. And in theory, it should call visit terminal, exactly. Uh, node is zero. Huh. Okay, so the type is 24. What is 24? 24 is literal. Ah, okay, damn it. I have to do the same thing uh, here. So we want this to be a lowercase, not an uppercase rule. Because otherwise, it's going to consider this literal a terminal rule, and that's not going to work. And I think that should work now. Implicit definition of token literal. Oh, okay. So let's replace all the uppercase literals with lowercase literals. And hey, okay. Now this should work properly this time. I think we can just um yeah this should be a lowercase literal and this should be a lowercase literal and same here we have the same issue both places all right uh time to test and i think we are done Specified cast is not valid. Okay. Identifier with array. And let's see what we got. So context dot get text. Let's see context dot get text first. Okay, so a of four. Four is the index. Uh, okay, specified cost is not valid. Oh, okay, because this is not going to generate um, an int, it's going to generate a literal. So what we have to do is take that literal and get its value. All right, let's give this another go. Uh, okay, uh, we are almost there. Unable to cast object type of variable reference to type I statement. Why are we getting a variable reference? Um, did I forget to create this? Okay, um, let's evaluate get text. Okay, so we are inside this um, adder four, and we, I think this is the problem. I think this var, uh, I think I forgot to parse it, to handle it. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so declaration. Yes, we forgot about the declaration. Okay, so we want to return a new variable declaration statement, and this one has a variable name which is uh, literal, or what is it? The name is uh, identifier with array.
context.identifier with array. Okay, and that will create um, a variable reference. So reference equals Okay, and then we will just take from the variable reference, we will take the name and the index, the width. Yep, and I think we should be done. If there are no more errors, then we are done with the parser. And all that's left to do is the simulation part okay and we have an output great we have three modules the first module is the adder module and it has three inputs two outputs that's great and it has one assignment statement on the left hand side we have two variable references on the right hand side we have this truth table with eight entries and if we look at an entry it's zero 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 okay let's look at the last one so this one should be one 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 and the output is one one yeah this looks pretty good to me um let's see okay the truth table works perfectly uh let's see the second function so the second module has three inputs two outputs which is correct it has five statements uh the first statement we declare variable c with the width and then we do some assignments which is great um, yeah I think we are done all that's left to do now is to simulate this thing so how can we do that uh, that's gonna be a bit of a challenge but challenges are fun uh, let's see Okay, so now that we have generated uh, the program, uh, what we want to do is uh, basically figure out which module, um, why is it not recognizing program? Oh, it's internal, public class program. And uh, public class module. Uh, yep, that's probably the reason. Okay, so uh, now we have parsed this uh, source file. Um, I think this one should be like this, if I'm not mistaken. And now this should work as well, this uh, filter. All right, uh, should we do the simulation part? Um, yay, it worked. And now we have parsed it. Uh, we have some... extraneous input at line four. Hmm. Uh, yeah, maybe that new line thing did not work very well. Expecting comma or new line. I think the problem might be that we are ignoring all the new lines. So what might be best is to simply add uh, something like a semicolon here. That would probably address the issue. But um, I mean the program is generated. The program looks fine to me. So I'm just going to leave it as it is. And hopefully it works. Okay. Now, for the simulation part, what do we need to do? Uh, as I said, first, uh, we need to collect to find our main module, program.modules.first, where x dot is main is true. And if main module is null, then we will just display a message box.show uh, 
Ram doesn't have a main module. And we are going to return. OK, and now we are going to let's save the program here. OK, and this will load our OK, and then we are going to try to find the main module. If it doesn't work, then we're going to throw an error. OK, um, now let's go over the inputs and outputs of this main module. Var input in main module dot inputs. And um, OK, this will contain a variable name and an index. So what we have to do here is to generate a toggle button. Toggle. Uh, in fact, I think uh, it might be a good idea to use uh, some of the XAML features here uh, to use bindings. Uh, all right. Although I'm thinking about how we can do a control which can have multiple toggle buttons. So if it's like a um, multi-bit thing, then it has multiple toggle buttons. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to create a custom control for that. OK. So let's create a new, I'm going to use the user control and let's call this input. Uh, so let's call this an input circuit input. Now this circuit input uh, should have a grid of um, dot column definitions. OK, we are going to add uh, two column definitions in the first column. Uh, we will set the width to auto and in the second column. OK, and in the first column, I'm going to put a text box so we can uh, manually edit the number that's in there. Um, and let's bind this to some property of a uh, circuit. I'm not going to use MVVC uh, because I just want to keep things simple. I'm just going to create a new variable here. Uh, let's set, uh, use a um, I kind of want to have, I want to know when it changes and, okay, uh, let's int value. Uh, in fact, let's use a bit set for the value. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, let's make this even better. Uh, let's add a reference to the actual. Yeah, in fact. Uh, okay, a bit set with the value. I'm thinking how to do this. how to bind a list of toggle buttons to the individual bits of this uh, input thingy. Yeah, I think I'm just going to have to generate them manually in code. So for the text box, binding, 
And let's try to set it to this value. Value dot what? Uh, so value dot, can we convert this to an int? Unfortunately not, which is kind of annoying. All right, uh, let's try to um, value int and let's implement both a getter and a setter. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm gonna have to make um, Okay, let's keep things simple. Let's just not do this at all. Uh, let's just keep um, things simple. So an input will have a text block with the name. Uh, we're gonna create that name uh, thingy in just a moment. And the... On the second column, we'll have a stack panel. And let's give it a name so that we can access it from the code behind. Um, and call this toggle container. Okay, uh, now how can we style these toggle buttons? That's a good question. Create dot column is one. So this will be in the second column. Okay, uh, let's add a toggle button here and see what that looks like. Okay, and uh, let's create a style for this toggle button. So let's go into the actual stack panel and Dot resources and let's create a style target type will be toggle button and let's set the min the max the yeah the max width to something small like um, I don't know 50 pixels maybe might be too much but we'll see all right it looks like that and let's also give it a minimum height and let's set the value to like 20 oh, yeah okay 20 by 20 should be just fine uh okay then uh, we want to add some events here so style dot triggers and let's have a a trigger uh, binding to is okay um is checked is maybe it's a another type of binding maybe it's not a data trigger i don't remember how to do this maybe it might be time to ask um chat gpt another question how can i add a custom a background when uh how can i modify the style of a toggle button in in wpf so that it becomes red when it is pressed. Oh, well. Chat GPT is not helping us today. A lot. Okay. 
So it creates the button and then it changes the style as I expected. And then I want to see how it does that event thing. Ah, uh, so it changes the template. Oh no. And then it sets. A trigger to. Okay, I think we can use trigger here as well. So instead of data trigger, just use trigger. To the is checked property, and when the value is um, true, then let's set the background to um, red. Okay, so if it is on, then we want to set it to something like green. Otherwise, otherwise the background will be set to red. Okay, so red means disabled, green means enabled. Simple enough. Okay, so this is how all the toggle buttons will look. And now let's go into our circuit here. And whenever we want to initialize uh, a toggle container dot uh, children dot add. And now we're going to create all the buttons for all the things in this bit set uh, for Okay, and I want to s get the size. Is that the cardinality? I think so. I plus plus. And for each bit, we will generate a um, What is wrong? Operator cannot. Oh, cardinality is a method. All right. And it returns an int. Great. So we are going to add a child toggle button. And we want to set the Um, tag, uh, we're going to set the tag to the index. So this way we can know whenever a toggle button is pressed, we can know which one it was. And set the corresponding bit. Okay, and let's create a variable out of this. So we can add the event. Um, it, checked okay so we basically need to is checked okay so it is checked but I think we need to handle the click event and then we want to modify this bit set here okay now um is checked should be the value of the actual bit here value dot get of i all right and then uh, we will add this button but yeah again something that i'd like to mention here is um, we should do this in the reverse order because we want the bits to be from the most significant bit to the least significant bit so we need to do this in the opposite direction, I think. So let's start from value.cardinality minus one all the way to zero. And I minus minus. Okay. And whenever the, okay, we set, the, we create the button. 
and then we handle the click event and then we add it to the container to the stack panel that's great and whenever we get a click then we need to update this bit set value dot set and let's see so first let's get the sender which should be a toggle button sender has toggle button is checked dot value okay so okay the index the index sh should be the tag of this node tag and then the value ah it's not called set it's called what it's called ah, i have to use set in clear this is annoying i cannot use set for both operations <laughs> so if the button is checked has value and the value is true then we will set the bit else value dot clear and that's it okay now something i'd like to do is add the i notify property changed and whenever this value gets changed i want to trigger uh, this event so what you don't have the right invoke okay um oh we need a sender and some okay the sender is this and the event changed arcs uh, the property name is called value and let's also use this syntax so um, if this is not set then this will not fail all right looks good to me and uh, yeah i will want to do something similar for the outputs now for the outputs i can just do like a simple rectangle Uh, yeah, and now I remembered that I forgot something here in circuit input. Uh, let's also create a public string name. And this is going to be the name that gets displayed here in the UI. And here uh, we need to set the data context. And we're going to bind to relative source being relative source um, ancestor mode equals self. So basically what this will do is the data context will be set to itself. And now we can access the name property here without any issues. Okay. Um, yeah, what else? Uh, yeah, let's make the um, this uh, look a bit better. So 
the name will be one third of the width and this will be two thirds the list of the toggle buttons okay this looks great this looks awesome uh, let's do the same for the circuit output uh, control i'm gonna add the same uh, data context here it's for the so that the bindings work and then we also have uh, this will look very similar except that we simply have a rectangle thing for the indicator or let's make this more interesting let's make it a um okay um yeah so we have a name and then we have this uh toggle container i'm just gonna leave the name because i don't want to bother and uh we're gonna have some borders here and we're gonna set their size to min width 20 max width 20 mix height 20 uh, max height in fact uh let's use an ellipse this might be more interesting uh, okay and fill uh, let's set the fill to red and the um, border i think is it called border not border it's called um, stroke yep and let's set the stroke to like a light gray silver maybe and the stroke width uh, stroke thickness all right let's set that to one so it has a little stroke actually let's make it 0.5 so it's a bit thinner okay and um I'd kind of like to bind this, but I don't, I'm not sure if this is even possible. Okay, we're not gonna bother with a trigger. Uh, we're just gonna do this in the code behind. Okay, and whenever we want to initialize, Uh, what we're gonna do here is uh, we're gonna have same as before string name and this is the name of the control and then a bit set with the value okay um let's um let's see okay and same as in the circuit input we are going to create uh, the little ellipses and we can still use the tag just like we did before and then um let's just modify the fill to okay if uh the value is true then we will set the fill to uh, what is this a brush so brushes dot um okay so if it's a one then we will use green if it's a zero we will use brushes dot red and we don't care about any clicks and uh, finally we will add it to the container now um let's create a new function date values i'm not gonna bother with i notify property changed i'm uh, just gonna create a public function that i will call manually from uh, this main window and um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate through all the children of this toggle container. And 
let's cost cost this to an ellipse. Uh, can we use cost? Yes, we can. And um, yeah, we're gonna update the fill of the ellipse. Child dot fill equals same as here. And instead of I, we have a child dot tag cost to an end. Okay, so now we have the UI. Uh, what is the problem? Oh, okay, so we have a name. Um, we already have a name property. In that case, we can just get rid of this and use that instead. I think it's perfectly fine to do that. Okay. So now let's go back to the main window. Um, okay, and for each input, we want to generate a new control. Um, um, circuit input. Uh, name will be equal to the input dot uh, variable name dot value uh, we're gonna create a, oh ah damn it i've used the wrong bit set here i should have used another one uh let's see where i don't want to use the antler bit set i want to use the c sharp bit set and i add there isn't any hmm uh, is it called it differently? Bit array. Yes, bit array. That's the one I wanted. Value dot count or length. Um, I think either one should be fine. Minus one. Okay. Yeah, and the rest looks good to me. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to use bit array, not bit set. I got confused. But that's okay. Uh, this is bit array, and now this should be bit array. Okay, and dot length minus one same as we did before and here okay so we don't have set and clear uh, value dot set oh yeah this is what i wanted in the first place okay so value dot set and this is the value and this is the index Looking good. Okay, back to the main window. Okay, control dot um, value will be equal to a new bit array of size. Um, control dot uh, value okay and now let's also set the control dot tag to be equal to this variable uh, in fact nah let's not bother with that um we have the name we have everything we need okay and now let's add this to the list so let's add this to this uh, list inputs And yeah, we will want to also subscribe to the event uh, whenever it changes. So control dot on property changed. Okay, and let's call this function input value changed. 
and the sender it will have the control itself and we can determine the name of the control from there so this looks pretty good okay let's save the main module here as well so we can use it later all right list um inputs dot uh, children items dot add and we're just gonna add this control there and we're gonna do the same for the outputs okay and we're gonna generate a circuit output Uh, we're gonna set the name and we're gonna set the value the initial value and then that's it and we're gonna add it to list outputs all right i think that should be all and yeah list inputs and list outputs should be cleared whenever we get to this open thingy items dot clear and same here list Yeah, okay, now we have a, new, a basic UI for this thing. Let's see if this works. I just want to see a couple of uh, buttons. Oh no, object reference, not set. Ah, okay, so it's expecting... Okay, we should set the value in when we construct the object. All right, that's great. Um, yeah, let's use that simplified thing. That's what we want. And also the value. Why didn't you set the value? And... Oh. New bit array of... Well, what was I seeing here? In put dot index that should give us the size and here it should be output dot index okay and here we have to do the same thing simplify yes i want to simplify great open no reference exception value is still null even though i have initialized it oh so what i think is happening is uh this gets uh, set after the constructor is called which is probably what we are encountering here okay so to fix this what we can do is simply i don't know um yeah, put the number of bits here in or set the initial value in the constructor. Initial value. And that's it. That should solve it. So value equals initial value, and then we do the rest. Uh, let's do the same for the output so that we don't get that error. Uh, okay, and we have to specify um, this. And all that's left to set after is the name. Ah, what? Bit array. Oh. Yeah. And same here. But it's going to be output.index. My face cam is stuck, but you can hear me, right? I don't know what's going on.
Uh, I don't know. It's not coming back. Uh, let me try to restart the camera. Just a second. Okay, we have an image now. Let's see. Um, yeah, let me just adjust it a bit. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's better, right? Now we I have the face cam. Yay. All right. Uh yeah, so I wanted to see if this program is working. Uh let's check it out. Um what is this? I don't see the indicators for some reason. Uh, did I mess something up here? In this, okay, it should be in column number one. Hmm. Yeah, you are always tough. It can get pretty annoying. I don't see the toggle buttons. Where are the toggle buttons? Uh, maybe it's the list view. Uh, let's not use list view. Let's use a stack panel. Um, so instead of list view, stack panel. Okay, and now we need to change this to children. Children, children, children. Mm, okay, this is not better. What is going on here? Why is it not showing me the... These beautiful buttons that I'm creating. Let's go through the debugger a bit and see if this button gets created or not. What? What the? Oh, okay. I um, forgot to do this. Okay, so the initial value is a bit array of length 0, count 0. Yeah, there's your problem. Okay, input. Oh, okay, so the problem here is that I'm using index 0, but 0 should in fact mean 1 uh, in terms of size. Yeah, that's the issue. Um, so I think the main module, okay, this is the main module. So we have A and B, which have a single input. Uh, the problem is that I set the default wrong. Uh, let's go to 
variable reference and let's set the default index to okay now uh, something here is that i'm thinking about uh, this only applies to um whenever we define a module right so this one should give us the length but the length should be whatever number is here plus one exactly because uh, if we set this to, uh, in fact, no. Yeah, if it's zero, then it should be one. That's basically it. Uh, it's as simple as that. For, okay, let's go to the model generator and change that, but only for the module. Uh, okay, so, Uh, okay, here after we um, obtain it, var in input, I don't know, um, variable reference equals this, and if var ref dot index equals zero, then we'll set it to one. Uh, this in fact should be more like um, instead of a variable reference this should be more like that uh, variable declaration but whatever we're just gonna leave it as it is we're not gonna change it anymore and let's do the same to the outputs and yeah we want to add this same here Mm, hold on a second. Um, yeah, this should be an output. It's just the name that's wrong. Okay, and then we add it here and also update the index. Okay, so now uh, this should work and now we should get the, our buttons, hopefully. Fingers crossed that we get our buttons. Uh, okay, I don't want to see this. Okay, here we go. Oh, uh, I do not want this to happen, but... Okay, and now we have two inputs. Uh, it kind of looks bad. It doesn't look great, but... Uh, okay, for R, um, I think I generated the wrong control type. Uh, yeah, it should be a control output, not input. Because it should have been round. It doesn't look awesome. Um, with some styling, yeah, we can make it look better. But yeah, it's fine. Uh, for what we need, it's fine. Okay, now for the simulation part. This is going to be... Uh, a bit of effort and yeah it's 3 a.m and i have to go to work tomorrow so i will do this maybe another day um i'm gonna do a part two to this uh, simulator here but yeah today i actually show made quite a lot of progress quite a lot more than i was expecting so i created a grammar i parsed it um, and I got it to the state where I can show some UI, I can... Yeah, I think I made quite a lot of progress today. Um, yeah, so in the next video, um, in this tiny little series that I'm thinking of doing, um, is to create the runtime model, where we go through basically each of these, and yeah, we will create these uh, little nodes and we will create this little uh, directed graph that I was thinking of. As I was saying here. So for example, we have A and B, which are inputs. They will be connected to an end node. So yeah, uh, all the modules will basically disappear. Uh, it will only be 
like um, simple operations like and or and so on. That's kind of the idea. Yeah, uh, we'll do this um, another time. But yeah, as a conclusion, uh, and kind of what I wanted to show today is how you can use ChatGPT because this was kind of the point where I uh, had a bit of a connection issue there. Uh, can you still hear me? I had a little connection interruption, but I think uh, you should be able to hear me now. Okay, so my point is ChatGPT is a great tool for a couple of things uh, in terms of programming. And I would honestly pay for using something like ChatGPT. It's really good. It's really great. Um, I was using it a lot. Uh, today we kind of used it to get us started to antler. Now, uh, as we advanced through the project, I just didn't see the need to use it. But sure, I could still use it uh, for certain things. But um, yeah, the great part about it is it can help you introduce you to a topic. That was the first point. And secondly, it is very useful when you are doing something that you've already done a thousand times. Like, uh, let's say, okay, um, generate a script that can, uh, in any language, so let's just say in Python, that can uh, find emails from, check for new e emails from hello at example.com and download all the attachments. Um, if any of the attachment is an image, resize it to 50%. Uh, if the attachment is a zip file, um, extract it. Okay. Uh, just ignore these warnings. They are not very useful. And here we go. So it uses PIL, which is an image processing library. It called zip file, which is a zip processing, um, a zip library. And here we go. It is actually generating a script which can do this. And I think this is awesome, um, especially for uh, smaller tasks for automation. I think it's a really good, nice tool. Um, now, as we advanced into this project that we started today uh, with the circuit uh, simulation stuff, uh, we just couldn't use it very much. Uh, now, I'm curious if I can use it to generate a class like one of these. I'm really curious about that. Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, again, the dreaded network error. Let's refresh a bit. Oh, they changed the UI. Hmm, this one was at the top, now it's at the bottom. Okay, um, generate a C sharp class which has five, pr which has the following properties. Uh, I don't know, let's just say name is main. Okay, let's just give it these name is main string okay is main as boolean and let's just say inputs list of strings and there we go it can actually generate it for me this is awesome yeah um So, uh, the main use cases that I've noticed are these. Uh, introducing to a topic, you know, uh, asking it to explain certain things, asking it to, okay, what is the error in this code? What is, um, 
it's like a more advanced search engine. It's like a more advanced Google, um, which can understand a lot better uh, your queries. And that's great. The second use that I've seen is to generate a lot of code, uh, as you've seen with the email example I've shown earlier. Um, it can uh, basically uh, grab pieces of code from existing repositories and tie them together. And that's awesome. Um, yeah, take an email, uh, do this with the input, do this with the other thing. That's another great thing about it. And the third one is to generate repetitive code. Um, as a developer, I hate creating these types of classes. It takes a lot of time. Um, and if I can get um, chat, you know, if I can get um, this chat GPT thing to generate it for me, then that's great because now instead of spending, I don't know, two minutes writing this class, then another two minutes writing another class, I can just spend 30 seconds uh, asking it, you know, writing the query. And I think that's great. And Obviously, we have to be very aware of the limitations. It can generate incorrect information. It can generate incorrect code. And again, we have to always check what is generating. We have to make sure that um, whatever it's generating is what we want. Uh, for example, I asked it to generate a Python-like syntax and it kind of did, but it's missing a very important component. It's missing the tab as um, indentation, uh, you know, the indentation as the scope thingy that Python has. It completely missed that. Um, I'm not sure if it can even generate it. Let's see if we can get it to generate it. Uh, can you generate an Angular grammar that can handle Python-like um, indentation based scope or whatever. I just, hmm. Okay. And it can generate it. Ah, uh, okay. So the idea is, hmm, this is actually very interesting. Uh, I think this is pretty interesting. Yeah, so it can generate things, but yeah, ultimately putting everything together into a workable script is gonna be up to you, obviously. It's not gonna replace your jobs. No, it's not. Okay, uh, if there are any more questions about uh, any of the topics that I talked about today, I, am, I can answer them right now. Otherwise, I'm gonna uh, end this live stream that has been very long but i think it was very interesting and i really loved working on this project i think it's a very interesting project creating a custom language parsing it um it was fun um uh, i kind of want to is this language going to be open source yes i'm gonna publish the code on github on the nanobytes dev channel i will put a link in the description when i'm done or and i'm also gonna put it on discord is that that sounds good? Um, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I think this was awesome. I think this project was pretty nice. I love working on it, and I'm really hoping to make another live stream. I don't know when, but I'm gonna make another live stream when I finish it. Um, yeah. So for the simulation part, I've kind of explained how I wanted to, how I. Um, expect it to work. Uh, for example, here for this truth table, the way this works in uh, real life is, uh, so let's say that we have um, A, B, and C in are the inputs and these are the outputs, right? Um, so R would be equal to Okay, um so you basically need to generate a combination of 
uh, okay, r equals. Um, and now we look at all the values where r equals 1. So it's this one, this one, this one, and this one. There are four examples. And what we can do is write something like this. Um, so in this example, we have uh, a is 0, so not a, and not b, and c. Uh, this is the first case, right? Then the second case would be not a, because a is 0, then b is 1, so and b, and um, it's not c. And then we go with this one. This one would be a and not b and not c. A, uh, a and not B and not C, or uh, the last case, which is all of them are ones. So A or B or C, uh, A and B and C, sorry. Okay, and now uh, the way this would work is we would uh, use some um, logical properties of this thing to try to simplify this expression and there are a couple of um, logical I don't know how they're called um, so for example if you get something like not a and a that's always gonna be zero because something and not something it's always gonna be zero and if we get you get something like uh, not a or a that's always going to be a one and if you can group these together so that you get some of these then you can simplify these terms but yeah this is going to be part of the optimization stage uh which i'm not even sure that i'm gonna tackle um looking at this i can see for example I can see this one and this one might be able to be might be simplified uh, and there was um, another rule uh, which was something like not a and b is equal to not a or not b or something like that it's kind of inverting the operation um, not a and b i'm not sure if this is correct but i think it was like this if i remember correctly um so if you can generate either this or this then you could theoretically simplify it in the expression here uh, what i was seeing here is this c right here which is the same and then we can group a and b and not a and not b so it would be something like not a and not um yeah in this notation it's a bit harder to understand if you use the mathematical notation it might make a lot more sense uh in mathematical notation um uh, this is like the multiplication and and uh no it's the opposite and is like the multiplication and or is like the addition so here you have three expressions that you add them together. So you can take like a common factor, which would be C. And then you have not A and not B or A and B. But I'm not even sure you can simplify that. Uh, yeah, I think you can simplify it within that um, other expression. Yeah, anyway, so once we generate this truth table then all we have is just very simple and and these would correspond to logic gates to the logic gates and and or and um, yeah that's the idea for the truth table yeah um thank you a lot for watching and i would guess i will see you next time i am um, no other questions okay thank you very much for watching see you next time have a nice day bye bye